Hopefully there'll be stuff in this video for everybody, but it is really aimed at those of you who still reach for your APS-C crop frame camera every time you shoot macro because of all of that tasty, tasty extra magnification you get from using it. If you're one of those people, pour yourself a restorative, grab a fresh box of Kleenex and have a seat because this is not going to be easy on you. It's time you learn the truth. It's not as big as you think it is. Before we get started, there are four things that I want to mention to you. Number one, stay till the end of the video. That is an order, because at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you some very, very important information related to Mitu Toyo objectives that you need to hear because it will rock your world. And for those of you over 70, having your world rocked is a good thing. It sounds dreadful, but it's not, it's a good thing. So stay till the end of the video. Number two, to my Patreon people, you are the best. You rock my world. Please keep doing what you're doing. Number three, if you're a fan of the ping pong ball and you've always thought it would be good to use as a diffusion tool in your macro photography, and you're getting results that aren't what you think you should be getting, the problem is probably the seam in the ping pong ball. What do you mean you didn't know there was a seam on a ping pong ball? How do you think they get the two halves together? I recommend using a rig something like this. It's known as the Orientation Dependent Distributed Bidirectional Axiolateral Lighting System, Oddballs for short, and it's remarkably effective for photographing textures. The reason for this rather specific design is because the seam was often getting in the way. If I didn't plan these things properly, I'd end up with a big heavy seam that was casting a shadow right across my texture. The way to avoid getting unwanted shadows in your photographs is to plan your seam position right from the word go. So the first thing I do is check for TMI which is trademark interference. As uh, demonstrated here, what you're looking for are trademarks that fall squarely on the seam. And the best way to see these is by transillumination. When you have a trademark smack in the middle of the clear part of the ball, it's obviously not gonna be any good because it'll be worse than having a seam there. I recommend placing the first subject axis defect or sad hole over the trademark. The second sad hole goes directly opposite. The next hole is the ARP GPS. That's the Allen Rectum Walled Pin Grabber Puncture Sight, which has to be 90 degrees from each of the sad holes on the seam. Directly opposite the ARP GPS, we need to place the trap door. Now, the trap door is for accessing the pin grabber and uh, placing our specimen before retracting it back into the oddballs. I spent a lot of time researching to find the best tool to work on the oddballs. What I came up with was the DD Shushi, the Double Dangerous Superheated Ultra Sharp Sphere Incisor. Not only is this device as sharp as a razor blade, but it's also as hot as the sun. And here's a pro tip. Keep the DD Shushi moving. Even a moment's inattention can cause the table tennis ball to explode in flames or melt completely. And best of all, this thing is real. This is something that I've been using in my studio for many years. I use it for really small insects with really interesting textures because of the three-dimensionality of the images and because of the controllability of the light. If you're into shooting really small insects like I am, this is something you really have to try. It's a very, very effective lighting tool for the tiniest of bugs. If you're not familiar with this technique, and this is something you wanna learn more about, there is gonna be an advanced macro photography course coming out. I don't know yet what platform it will be on, but it will be purely technique, how to, and it will be detailed. I mean, detailed, through the microscope detailed. So if that's something that might interest you, keep your eyes open for it, and I'll give you some more information as soon as I have it. 
This is great for shiny insects. You really need to be doing this. Number four is to the guy that sent me an email yesterday uh, asking me a question, but first making a statement. The statement was, you are one weird old man. I should have stopped reading there. The question was, what do you do for fun? And I do all the normal stuff that everybody else does for fun. Posing a couple of dead flies as lovers, kissing to say goodbye through a pane of glass at the county jail. It's very touching. I had a tear in my eye when I did this. Normal stuff. I also photographed some ladybirds. This is Audrey and Winston and their son Maggot going on holiday. What do you do? This whole idea of using a crop frame camera to get more magnification is a very persistent misunderstanding. Let's first look at why people think it is the case. So here is a photograph of uh, one of my favorite skipper butterflies. And uh, this was shot on a full frame camera. I put the same lens on a crop sensor camera also a Nikon. This one was a D7500. Now, when you position these photographs side by side, your brain really wants to believe that the crop sensor butterfly is bigger. And that's only because we have uh, an indefinite frame of reference that is that bounding box of the frame, the frame size. There aren't any really strong visual clues to explain to us why these boxes that appear to be the same size are different, uh, unless we look at the, the pixel counts, which we don't, we're just gonna look at the two photographs, we're gonna jump to the conclusion that the, the butterfly on the right is bigger. You've got more magnification from that camera. Let's talk for just a minute about what a lens does, because it really just has one job, and that is to magnify. Now, the factor by which it magnifies may or may not be above one. So its magnification may make the subject smaller, but that's really the purpose of the lens. Of course, today's lenses do other things as well. They focus for you or they allow you to focus them, which gives you a little bit more physical freedom of where you're gonna be. Uh, and also they correct the aberrations that result from using any lens. Every lens causes aberrations. It's just how much and how well they're corrected for. Now, whenever you measure things, you need to have a conventional way of doing the measurement so that everybody knows what you're talking about. And in camera lenses, we use a thing called the maximum reproduction ratio. Before we get too caught up in the macro lens world, let's talk for just a minute about a simple lens. It's a 50 millimeter f1.8 D. It's an icon lens. It's a very, very sharp lens. It's less than $100. Also has a manual aperture ring, making it particularly well suited for macro. This lens has a maximum reproduction ratio of 0 0.15. That's the same thing as saying, at the minimum focus distance, this will give you an image that is 0.15 times the size of the actual subject you're photographing, which is at the minimum focus distance, which for this lens is 18 inches, a foot and a half. So when we describe the maximum reproduction ratio of a given lens, that is what we're saying. We're saying that at the minimum focus distance, this lens will produce an image that is X times the size of the actual object we're photographing. Now, a macro lens is a very special case of that. Most macro lenses are macro lenses based on the fact that they have a one-to-one -one or a 1.0 maximum reproduction ratio. Now, there are plenty of macro lenses that have a ratio of one to two, meaning that the, the, the image on your sensor is half life size. Some have uh, magnification ratios all the way up to five to one, meaning the image is five times larger than the subject. The Canon MPE 65 is one of those lenses. Now this is important information to have about any lens because it's gonna be the crux of choosing the right camera for your macro photography. So here's another 
photograph taken with a full frame camera. And again, when we look side by side at a photograph taken with a crop sensor camera, it appears that our subject is magnified. That is a very successful optical illusion. We have to remind ourselves that that's not the case. The lens determines the magnification, not your camera. Lenses are complex things. To work out the magnification of a lens like this, you have to know where the intermediate planes are. You have to know the size and the position of the entrance pupil, the exit pupil. You have to have a lot more information than Tamron puts in their spec sheet. And we don't have that. So whenever we use a calculation, we are estimating information about that lens and about its magnification. If you want to know the magnification of a lens, measure the magnification. That's the only way you'll ever know. Put it on a stand, find its minimum focus distance, and photograph a millimeter rule at the minimum focal distance. You just have to then add up the number of visible millimeters and you know exactly what your maximum reproduction ratio is. And that's what I always recommend. Any calculations you do are going to be inferior to simply measuring it. So instead of trying to figure out all of these complicated mathematical equations, we take something of a shortcut by using a generalization that's called the thin lens formula. The thin lens formula takes all of that difficult mathematics and boils it down to an estimation of roughly what the numbers should be. And in some cases, it can be very far off. In other cases, it can be pretty close. But what the thin lens formula tells you is that the re reciprocal of the focal length of the lens, in this case, 1 over 50 or 0 0.02, is equal to the reciprocals of the distance from the lens to the object plus the reciprocal of the distance from the lens to the sensor. So what that does is it ties the two together inextricably so that when the distance between the sensor and the lens increases, because of that formula, the distance from the lens to the subject has to decrease. And that's how macro photography works. That is what an extension tube does. It moves the lens away from the sensor, allowing us to get closer to the subject on the other end and get more magnification. And these are the only ways that you can get magnification. Switching to a camera with a different size sensor isn't going to do it. So a couple of take on points. There are a lot of good reasons to reach for a crop frame camera when you're going out to shoot macro. It's lighter, it's smaller, it's easier to lug around all day. It has much smaller image files that download quicker, that are easier to work with in, in Lightroom and Photoshop. Using a smaller sensor on a given lens does not increase its magnification. It just increases the appearance of magnification. It's really not. Using a high megapixel large sensor camera is a good way to be able to reserve the right to crop quite a lot, yet still have a very high quality image. That's not quite as true with a crop frame because with a crop frame, you have less territory from which to crop. Uh, meaning that your crop's going to be removing a larger portion of the photo sites that you do have available. So there is an argument for shooting full frame and leaving yourself the option of cropping. Whereas when you shoot with a, a crop frame, the goal should be that you fill the frame or at least satisfy your creative needs in terms of your composition. But I would rather err on the side of having too much sensor than not enough. So really the message here is choose the right camera for the job. Before I go, I want to share something with you for no reason other than I have been so excited by it that uh, I can barely contain myself and I have to tell somebody. 
I found an insect that I'd never photographed before. When you find something that's probably been right under your nose. I remember feeling this same way when I found a particular assassin bug that lives in goldenrod around here uh, that is incredibly strange looking and a wonderful thing to photograph. But this one took the cake. They're very tiny and uh, they're very bland looking black bugs that crawl on the stems of these, these uh, particular plants in the swamp. I was able to, to photograph a few of them and uh, this is what I found. I'm not gonna say anything else about it for now because I think I'm gonna do a video on everything about this particular experience of shooting these because I've never, I have never been so excited to see uh, a new bug as I have been this. When I initially processed the images, I almost fell out of my chair because I've never seen anything quite like it. It was a fantastic experience and I wanted to share that with you. I told you at the beginning that if you stick around to the end, I was going to give you some world changing news. A few weeks ago, I did a video about the Mitutoyo M-Plan 5 times apochromatic infinity corrected microscope objective. And I called it the best objective for macro photography that exists. I stand by that. I'm figuring price into this too, but it's the only one of the apochromatic high-end long working distance objectives that is even remotely affordable. After I did that video, a comment was left by Steve. Thank you, Steve. This is huge. I really appreciate you doing this. And he told us all about a vendor out west in the United States called Light Glass Optics. Light glass is what Leon Hook used to call his microscopes, I think. Uh, but this shop is a treasure trove. The place is owned by Jeff McDowell, who I haven't spoken to, uh, but I uh, will eventually, I think, catch up with him and talk to him. But his shop uh, carries a lot of really cool surplus stuff in optics. I was incredibly excited just to discover the place. Then I heard that he was selling brand new Mitutoyo M-Plan objectives. This and the 10X, and I think even the 7.5X, which is an even more expensive lens, at a price that I did not believe was possible until Mike in California, thank you Mike, great friend of the show, huge supporter, ordered and bought one of these from Mr. McDowell, uh, at light glass. And he said that not only is it real, not only is it brand spanking new, but he said the experience he had in making the purchase and getting the device sent to him was second to none. That's good enough for me. If Mike says it's it's a, a, a legit deal, then it is. $420 for a $780 lens. And it is the best macro lens you'll ever buy. I encourage anybody who is serious about getting into higher magnification macro to go and get one of these while you still can, because if you don't, you'll be buying a used one for $500 or a brand new one for close to eight. Just make sure if you order one, say this isn't the last one, is it? Because Alan wants that one. The one I have been using was a loner this is from Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. This is very kind of you to let me borrow this. This one has been kicked all the way from Japan. Uh, I've never seen brassing this heavy on this objective. Uh, and it has hazing all in the front element, yet it's still the best lens that I currently have in my possession. Light glass optics. I'll leave a link in the show notes. From what I understand, he has a number of these brand new objectives but it's not an infinite number so thanks for watching thanks for being excited about this stuff like i am i'm really looking forward to this course next up a quick one we're going to be talking about chromatic aberration corrections in microscope objectives and uh, it'll be a bit of a summary but it'll still be fun and i'll probably have some nice pictures to show you until then 
Take care, stay safe, be well, and go to Light Glass Optics and get yourself a Mitu Toyo so that people won't think you're square. But save some money for Patreon.